So, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this plenary on quantum metrology and sensing. Uh, the talk today will be given by Jörg Wartrup, and the title is uh, Solid State uh, Quantum Sensing. So Jörg Wartrup is the director of the third institute of physics at the center and the center for applied to quantum technology in Stuttgart. Uh, uh, he is also a Max Planck, Max Planck fellow at the Max Planck Institute for solid state research uh, in Stuttgart also. Uh, Jörg Wartrup is well known to, known to be a pioneer in solid state quantum physics. Uh, he has for the first time detected the spin properties of NV centers in diamonds. He has pioneered uh, numerous applications of NV centers, such as measuring the magnetic field at the nanoscale, detecting single electron spins, or measure nuclear magnetic resonance with unprecedented sensitivity. And today he, he will speak of all of those uh, applications and achievements. So, you're welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry for that, I needed to interrupt my screen. You can see my screen, can you? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so Thierry, thank you for your kind words of introduction and also for, thank you for inviting me. Um, it, uh, it's a pleasure actually to talk to you and, and present uh, you some we see you, but we do not see your screen. I don't know if yeah. you share it. Yeah, I share, I'm sharing it. Now, let me just do it again. Is this better now? No? No. Uh, okay, no. Uh, okay, let me just redo it. Yeah, I think it's okay now. Okay. Yes, it's coming. Okay, so now it, it should it's be okay. on. It's All right, okay. perfect. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure actually to talk to you today and to them present you some of our, well, recent results, but also giving you an overview of where specifically the field of solid state quantum sensing um, is standing these days. Now, um, uh, so, so the quantum sensing uh, we are doing in the lab um, actually has uh, developed uh, over the past decade uh, into quite uh, a variety of uh, different activities, uh, starting from you know medical diagnostics, uh, and I will give you an example of, of that later on, uh, to bioanalytics. That's what you see here on the top right corner, where uh, people and, and we're among those people were um, putting individual nanoparticles, in this case specifically diamond nanoparticles, to target different tumors uh, in a mice. So that that's a classical labeling technique, the different diamond nanoparticles are doped with different um, dopants so that they give different emission colors. Uh, but they not only label the tumor uh, because of quantum sensing, because of the spin properties uh, of the dopants, um, they also measure properties of the environment, for example, the certain protein species. Uh, and that's quite unprecedented uh, in bioanalytics. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the system and, and, and the method also uh, have developed into probably one of the um, most uh, spectacular uh, nanoscale quantum technologies in, in material science and specifically also in solid state physics. Uh, so there is hardly a month uh, uh, this year where there has not been one high profile publication on people using scanning probe and V-center uh, magnetometry to measure different properties of solids. And, and one example here from our group is uh, the image of uh, Mori magnetic pattern in twisted uh, two-dimensional magnets. I'm coming to that. And on top of that, uh, also industry is now getting engaged uh, in the technique. So uh, already quite some time ago, we teamed up with, with Toshiba and Seagate, both of them being producers of solid state hard disk drives, and they wanted to get a precision measurement of the magnetic fields of the right head of those structures. And as a matter of fact, uh, they are now using prototype uh, systems uh, in their research and development lab to measure uh, uh, magnetic field profiles. And all of that uh, we are following in, in one uh, European project, Asterix, which is a pretty sizable consortium exploring basic application, but also industry 
related application uh, of NB quantum sensing. And it happens to be that Thierry is the coordinator of the project. All right, so uh, let me go through a couple of uh, basic facts before I'm venturing into uh, different applications. So the, the solids we are working with mostly are wide band gap semiconductors. That is, uh, if, if I plot here, the, the valence band edge and the conduction, conduction band edge, uh, typically the, the energy gap uh, is on the order of three electron volts or larger. We dope those solids uh, with impurity atoms, uh, which define two level systems uh, in the band gap, being uh, as well isolated from, from actually the, you know, the global properties of the solid that is of the band gap as, as possible. Uh, we uh, typically choose systems which have optical excitation and emission in the electron volt regime so that you can use high quality photodetectors to measure actually the optical response of those defects. Uh, and this is how we address and read out, in most cases, how we address and read out our uh, sensor. And then the sensor levels in themselves are um, spin levels, um, which are somehow associated with this optical transition. For example, the spin levels of electrons, as I'm drawing them here. And um, so sometimes we also use nuclear spins, as, as you will see, as, as ancilla uh, qubits for certain measurement processes. And it is these spin transitions we use for sensing. And uh, we choose our solids such that uh, the spin transitions here are, have um, an, as good uh, relaxation and decoherence pro uh, properties as possible. So that we can read out, you know, for example, the Zeeman splitting here between these spin levels with a precision better than, than Hertz or so, or in other words, than femto electron volts. And that's quite remarkable for solids. And, and certain solids like diamond, for example, or silicon carbide, because they are lightweighted, they have small spin orbit coupling exactly, you know, fall into this category of very good solid state uh, quantum sensor system. Now, the, the, the quantities we measure, we typically measure in the lab, is on the one hand magnetic fields. Um, you know, you have spin levels, which are your sensor levels. So uh, measuring the Zeeman splitting uh, is, is quite natural. Uh, and the, the examples I will show you today, I fall exactly into this magnetic field measurement uh, category. But we also measure electric fields. There is a slight spin orbit coupling to the ground state spin levels, so that they split as a function of electric field. Um, and, and you know you can show that you can measure a single electron charge at around uh, 200 nanometer distance, and that you can, for example, use. And people are using it to measure here the electric field profile across the flash memory cell. This is what you see as a crosscut electron microscope image here. And in addition, you can measure quantities like temperature force uh, and so on and so forth, uh, because the sensor in itself is a solid. Let this concept is change in front of temperature and force, and you, you can actually do those kinds, and you can actually measure those kind of quantities. All right, so uh, let me start to give you uh, a couple of examples of what we are doing. So one specific strength of the sensors we are working with is that they can be rather small. So they can be actually very well utilized uh, to measure uh, the quantities I was mentioning with the spatial resolution of a few 10, if not a few nanometers. And the breakthrough in the field was that, that structures like this became available um, to the community. So what you see here is a diamond. You see here a small protrusion. At the end, I was power pointing a red dot. And this red dot is where a single diamond and center is. And you can move that whole structure here by this stylus in an atomic force type of fashion. So you can scan it across the surface. And, and these days, there are at least two companies, two Swiss-based companies, uh, which are selling actually these structures. And they also started now to sell whole instruments built around uh, these scanning prop systems. Um, and I'm going to show you, give you one example of an application uh, um, for material science, which I, Think is, is very indicative of what it can do. 
Um, so recently, uh, we and, and uh, most notably the group of Jean Jacques and Patrick Malatinsky, both of them are members of Asterix, uh, started to look into two dimensional magnetic um, systems. So, uh, two dimensional materials, which is uh, uh, one of the, the, the uh, very popular research areas in solid state science these days, uh, and, and specifically, um, um, those showing magnetism uh, were a rather recent addition to the uh, all the effects or all the properties you can have in 2D materials. And uh, the point is that these are very, I mean, it's an atom or it's almost an atom thick layer of material. So the, the magnetic moment uh, density is rather low and the magnetic field these structure measure uh, produce are rather small. And the only way up until Two, three years ago to measure the magnetism of those structures was by a magneto optic carry effect, right? So you shine a laser on the system, the polarization of the laser changes as a function of orientation of magnetic moment. And then you can, if you have a single flake, right, this is supposed to be a single flake of chromium I3, uh, you can actually show uh, that there is magnetism by looking at the average rotation angle of the laser. So this is an XY scan, it's an optical microscope image. Now you take the same flake here uh, and, and you uh, use an NV center, and this is now a result, the result. So, so you take your tip, you scan it across uh, the, uh, the chromium I3 or any other 2D material, and you do an XY scan, and this is what you see here. I mean, the quality of these flakes is, is really bad because they, you know, they produce them by the Scott shape method. But what you can see is that your scanning probe and, and this system is measuring a certain in this case, magnetic moment density, um, and which is homogeneous across the flake. I mean, all of these, these greenish spots here is just where the flake is ruptured, where it's defective. Uh, and the point I would like to make here is that this is specifically useful because uh, the measuring this magnetic moment occurs in a quasi calibration free way. This is very much in contrast to other methods like magnetic force microscopy or low end microscopy, which have way harder, which, which are not sensitive enough to measure the magnetization anyway, but they also uh, need calibration. Okay. And recently what we were doing is actually measuring uh, the, um, measuring two layers uh, which uh, of, of this material, which are twisted with respect to each other. And you probably have heard about you know, uh, this, this uh, piece of twistronics in solid state. For example, if you have two graphene sheets and you twist them with respect to each other, uh, uh, at a certain angle, they show fantastic uh, electronic properties. Um, or if you do this with transition metal dicalcogenite, you, you generate additional flat band, excitonic bands, uh, which show a uh, super interesting uh, optical uh, property, for example. So that's an entirely new way of how to do materials and how to modify materials. And, and what we were showing is if you take two uh, of these uh, two dimensional layers of these two dimensional magnetic materials, for example, chromium I3, you twist them slightly with respect to each other. You start to see a more ray, a super pattern of magnetism in, in those structures. I'm not going into details, but I'm just Give you this this um, this picture here, um, where you see this periodic structure of an uh, antiferromagnetic and a ferromagnetically ordered um, uh, domain, and uh, the, the scale bar here is 100 nanometer, and that tells you that you need high sensitivity and high spatial resolution actually to unravel uh, these kind of structures. All right, so this was mag uh, uh, quantum sensing on. On the nanoscale, uh, let's go to larger scale systems. And, and what I'm showing you here is a kind of a universal uh, uh, chart of uh, magnetic fields, which are uh, actually generated by physiological activity. So which um, you and I are generating constantly. So this is your magnetic flux density from micro Tesla, right, Earth magnetic field down to femto Tesla field. And, um, Hearts, for example, are generating around 100 picotesla uh, magnetic field uh, peaks. Muzzles are generating around a few picotesla. Brain activity is typically femtotesla activity. Um, and well, there, 
there, there is different techniques which people have applied to measure these, these fields. And without going into all of the details of what techniques are used, I think by, by large, you can say that whenever you want to measure something below a PICO test or so, quantum sensors are the only way of doing that. And, and this is what um, actually uh, um, is already used. Um, so uh, specialized hospitals have systems like this. This is a squid-based squid magnetic encephalography machine. Um, so, so the aim is here to measure magnetic fields uh, generated by brain activity. Typical field strengths are on the order of a uh, few tens of femtotester. The typical frequency range, if I go back to this transparency here, there's also a frequency range, right? So the typical frequency range is on the order of, is from a few hertz to a few tens of hertz. And the way this is now, these magnetic fields are measured uh, these days is by using squids. Squids need to be cooled, and this is why you have these sizable uh, installations. Um, and, and that is actually limiting this technique to really very few hospitals per uh, country or per nation. All right, a, a big uh, change in the, or a big quantum leap, I, I dare to say, which came uh, about the last couple of years is that miniaturized atom vapor magnetometers actually made their way from basic research labs to applications. And, and there is once again, another uh, large EU project also in this pillar for quantum sensing, Maxima, exploring the use of these miniaturized atom vapor magnetometers. There's a very nice uh, paper uh, from, uh, I think it's like two, three years back, uh, from a group in the UK, University College London, where they were showing that you can use this atom vapor magnetometer to measure brain magnetic fields. Uh, and here, by the way, you can still see the old uh, uh, NEG machine in the back. And the big advantage, the big step forward is that uh, the, the subject can move while the magnetic field activities are recorded. And that's for clinical practice, that, that's a big step forward. Now, uh, uh, what we are trying to do in, in, in Asterix, and uh, this is mostly work of a small company we have, is doing similar things with solid state based systems. Um, uh, the solid state based sensors can be much smaller uh, so that you can make endoscopes uh, out of them. And then here you see a prototype we were making recently. The diameter here is, is on the order uh, of, of five millimeter or so. The active sensor head is way smaller. And recently we were using this actually to measure uh, hard magnetic field. And that's what you can see here. This is a hard magnetic field amplitude. And this is uh, the, the uh, time trace. And you see, well, you see these small spikes here which go up to 100 people tesla, uh, but most of the time the signal is, is way smaller. Uh, and, and the big vision here is to make sensors even smaller so that you can just you know, put them on the chest and, and carry them around uh, with you. All right, so um, one other field of application is actually looking at electronic devices. Uh, and I was saying that you can actually utilize or that you can make imaging devices out of these uh, solid state sensors. And, and one way of, of particularly easy way of doing this is not to take a scanning probe tip, but to take such a diamond chip with a thin layer of NV centers and then put whatever you are interested in on top. Uh, and then, for example, you can be interested in, in an integrated circuit, and you can try to uh, you can you can be interested in looking at whether the circuit is functional or not. And you can look at then with these microscopes, you can measure the functionality by actually measuring the magnetic field which is generated by the wire in the integrated circuit. So that's a kind of a control method, if you like, uh, to look into current flow in in uh, buried structures like integrated circuits. And we were doing this um, together uh, uh, with Infineon. So they were making us such a trip. Uh, and we were actually using our imager, our white field, we call it white field imager. It's a non-scanning technique once again to measure current flow uh, in, in, these, uh, in this uh, chips here. And this is one uh, particular structure you see. I should add that these are high frequency chips operating in the gigahertz range. Uh, and, and here you see a defective device. 
right? And it, it actually takes you like uh, less than a minute putting the diamond on or the chip on doing the measurement and doing the diagnosis. So, so this is now starting to mature into um, a technique um, which has applications in the field. All right, so this is my last, uh, the last couple of slides I want to show you. Uh, it's about using of these images now uh, in uh, medical or biomedical diagnosis. Um, as you probably know, uh, magnetic resonance tomography, MRT, is, uh, is one of the most abundant methods uh, actually to diagnose soft tissue in, in, in hospitals all around the world. Uh, its spatial resolution is limited to, say, centimeters or 10 millimeters or so because of the sensitivity of these uh, machines. And now uh, what we are up and about to do is we are uh, and actually improving the sensitivity of those machines so that eventually you can actually measure micron-sized objects or uh, probably even single protein that is down to nano-scale sized objects. And, and we are pretty confident that you not only can measure structure of that object, you can also measure dynamics, you can measure chemical processes related to mass, temperature, pH, metabolite changes, and so on and so forth. So, um, well, it, 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 once again, uh, so what you are replacing are machines like this, which are now existing and which, which probably are in your institution in the chemistry, biochemistry or medical department, uh, which, have a, which actually need on the order of 10 to 15 nuclei to produce the, the signal. And you, we want to replace it, or we are replacing it with these quantum sensors, which are already uh, a decade ago have shown that you probably just need 100 nuclear spins or so in a sample volume of a few nanometers, doing exactly, having exactly the same functionality. Now, uh, one, of the, the, one of the roadblocks or the challenges in the field uh, in the past was that actually this nuclear magnetic resonance, and the same is true for uh, magnetic resonance imaging, actually um, is, is not um, popular because of its sensitivity, obviously not, but because of its chemical specificity. So you can exactly know what kind of compound you are looking at. And the reason is that there is a multitude of interactions uh, um, of, um, which you can use actually to specifically identify the chemical composition um, of your target structure. For example, chemical shift, uh, but also J cups in top measurement. And for that, you need a very good spatial resolution. And the spatial resolution is typically on the order of a hertz. So this, this spectrum here has um, a, a frequency width of around 100 hertz. And you need to be able to identify all those lines to know which kind of protein, which kind of, of amino acid you have in your sample space. Now, question is, uh, can you actually do that also with quantum centers? Uh, and typically, the way this in, in classical uh, machines uh, this is done is you record a spectrum, which is a time trace, you do a Fourier transformation and you get the spectrum. Uh, and, and also the community has worked very much towards making this also possible with quantum centers. Uh, for that, uh, what you need to have is besides the sensor electron spin of, for example, the ND center, you need to have additional nuclear spin, which serve as a chiller qubit. Uh, Typically, you find them actually by using your quantum sensor to characterize actually the vicinity of your sensor material itself. And, and Tim Tamanyao and his group, for example, have brought it to more than 20 nuclear spins. Actually, you can selectively address and isolate around such an ND center. And, and then what you can do is um, you can run uh, the quantum algorithm, uh, in specifically now the quantum Fourier transformation, where you use the nuclear spins as ancillary qubits to do actually the QFT. So the electron spin is recording the signal. You run your QFT algorithm. Uh, you actually run the proper sequence. And lo and behold, after you have done your quantum Fourier transformation, um, you see um, a spectral resolution, which in the case of this specific uh, molecule here, this is the perfluor ether, um, which has uh, paramagnetic carbon and fluorine nuclei. 
and the fluorine nuclei are sitting in, in, in two slightly different chemical environments. Uh, the, these, these oranges, pinkish ones here, actually are responsible for that peak, and, and the other one actually is responsible for that peak. And chemists from that, for example, can analyze the, the configuration, the, the twist and tilt angles of the individual uh, atomic moieties within this molecule very precisely. The, the spectral resolution here uh, is on the order of 10 hertz or so. That's not enough to really look, for example, at individual proteins or do a fine structure analysis of complex molecules. But it's a good step showing that also the use of quantum algorithms and sophisticated quantum measurement protocols actually help uh, in analyzing um, molecules. Okay, so last but not least, you can now once again also turn this in, into an imaging uh, uh, method. And, and for this, we were using uh, um, a single cell uh, and we were trying to measure actually the location of the phospholipids which make the cell membrane. And uh, uh, so, so actually our imager, it more looks like an optical microscope. You put the specimen on top and you get a bright field image. So that's an optical image of one of a cell. And, and the, the scale bar here is 10 micrometer. Uh, and, and now you can also stain, you can put a dye on the cell membrane. And here you see the cell membrane. And now this is uh, our MRI image. So that's a micron scale MRI image. The scale bar once again here is 10 micrometer and you clearly see the cell membrane lighting up. Now I'm, uh, I'd, I'd like to compare this to one of the first uh, magnetic resonance tomography measurements, which has been done, uh, you know, uh, more than 40 years back. Uh, it's the same murky signal to noise ratio, just the scale by is different. So once again, this is probably 10 to 20 microns, well, 10 microns, whereas this is half a meter. And that's actually the cut of a um, um, MRT cut of um, a subject of the All right, so uh, this is the vision we are uh, having, making MRI portable. And this is uh, the prototypes we are doing, we and others are doing and uh, now this is my summary in my last slide. Um, I believe that this nanoscale quantum sensing really is super helpful for solid state of material science. High sensitivity magnetometry will have an impact in various areas of application, for example, biomagnetic fields. And this quantum MRI is really something which has unprecedented sensitivity. And this is the people here in Stuttgart working on the subject. We have different funding agencies. I thank those people and I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, York, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation of uh, NV centers and all their applications. Uh, we have time for a few questions. So I encourage the people in the audience to, to type their question in the chat, uh, if they have some. Um, Maybe I can start asking a question. So uh, NV Center seems to be a very uh, large, uh, well, quite the, the almost perfect quantum sensor. But are there some uh, limitations in NV centers that uh, there, there are, are, there, are there some room for uh, developing new uh, new defects or investigating new defects for quantum sensing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, diamond is a uh, as a solid, is a pretty ex exotic material, right? Uh, you have a hard time to make it conductive, for example, do electrical readout in those structures, although people also in Asterix are doing this, uh, but that's not as mature as, as it could be. And so other materials, for example, like silicon carbide I was showing, or rare earth dopants, uh, certainly are, are very good candidates, uh, which I'm pretty sure will mature and, and make their impact in the field. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see a question, uh, which is uh, uh, a disadvantage in uh, MRT is the scanning time. Uh, what scanning time would you predict for, this, for a system based on your sensors? Yeah, so the scanning probe, I mean, is mostly limited by the signal to noise you have. In the end, it's a complex measurement, right? And you have a single dopant doing this. Um, so the, the scans you were seeing, uh, easily take like two, three hours or so. So uh, I would say for, for solid state uh, and material science, this is 
tolerable if you do it science. Uh, if you want to be faster, you need to have this wide field imager like I was showing for the, for the micro uh, electronic structures. This is, um, their imaging times are 30 seconds or a minute at the expense of spatial resolution, of course, right? Okay, thank you. I see another question from Rémi Jager. Uh, do you think that NV magnetometers will be able to compete, complement with atomic helium magnetometers for MEG applications in the short term? <clears throat> uh, short answer, I don't think so. Um, I think uh, the, the NV is an added technique and, and what we think where they can contribute is by size. So if we can approach, uh, um, say, the area of interest very closely, if you, for example, in a surgery, right, if you go inside the skull and you want to see if you have functional brain tissue, I, I think then NVs are good. But if you stay outside of the skull, I, I think the, the atom vapor magnetometer um, will be the leading technology for, where, for quite some time to come. Okay, thank you. Um, I do not see any other question in the chat. Um, maybe I can ask uh, a last question. Uh, you mentioned the use of uh, nuclear spins to, to increase the sensitivity of the sensors. Uh, so what is the gain? How much can you, can you gain with the coupling with uh, nuclear spins? Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, this is about, it's, it's essentially about spectral resolution. Uh, so it's not about sensitivity. So it's, it's, you could say it's, it's the kind of dynamic range you are extending. And this is massive, right? It, it's easily a factor of 10 to the three to 10 to the four or so you are gaining. This is what you need for this NMR, but this is a very specific um, application. Uh, I, I have a hard time to see that you increase sensitivity with, with insular and nuclear qubits. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I do not see any other question in the chat, and I think it's uh, we are at the, the end of this uh, of this talk. So uh, I would like to to thank you, York, very much for for this presentation. Uh, I would like also to to thank all the the attendees to 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 follow this this presentation. And okay. this is yeah. this closes the presentation. <laughs> okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.